Now we'll talk about visual snow syndrome. This is one of the least understood conditions in eye care, so I bet many of you might be interested. Today we'll talk about the symptoms of visual snow syndrome, how it's diagnosed, its pathophysiology, and ultimately its treatments. Let's take a look. Channel. This channel is dedicated to providing you with the most informative and up-to-date eye health information so you can learn more about your eyes and vision. If you are new here, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and turn on the notifications so you won't miss out my future videos. You can also recommend this channel to people around you if you find it helpful. So, visual snow syndrome, commonly referred to as visual snow or simply BS. Excuse me. VS is a condition where instead of having normal vision, patients see these constant, innumerable flickering dots and absolutely everything that they're looking at. Some patients describe visual snow as grainy or pixelated television static, similar to what you see on the analog television channel on the tune. The dots are usually black and white, but can sometimes be colorful as well. These drifting settings are present in all lighting, but can be more obvious on plain backgrounds or in dimmer settings, especially when you're in a dark room. Patients with visual snow see these stacks all the time, from the time they wake up in the morning all the way to the moment when they go to bed at night. Patients even report seeing them when they close their eyes when sleeping, so it's truly something that can be turned off, even by turning off the light. Now, guess what guys? I actually have visual snow! I remember having this for as long as I can remember. So when I was a kid, I would tell my mom, Hey mom, do you notice this tiny little black and white dots moving quickly in the air? And my mom would look at me and think that her son was crazy. And in the beginning, I didn't know how I was supposed to describe it to other people. And so I thought everyone had it and the world was supposed to look this way. But it was not until recently that I found out that there was actually a name for it. Yes, I finally solved the misery that had been puzzling me for over a decade. Visual snow can vary in terms of severity. There are people with very mild visual snow that they barely notice at all, and they live a normal life just like everybody else. Or there are people with extremely severe visual snow. The symptoms are so debilitating that they can't read or operate a vehicle as a normal person. Things like that. Fortunately for me, I have a very mild case of visual snow, so in most cases, I can simply tune it out and ignore it. However, I do know that there are people who are really bothered by visual snow to the point that they can't live a normal life. I get that. So that's the reason why we really need to be talking about visual snow to raise your awareness of the condition to better help out those people in need. Visual snow is a very poorly understood condition that isn't mentioned in any of my ophthalmology or tree textbooks. In fact, many eye doctors I've met haven't even heard of the term visual snow. I need to go online and search for scientific articles or journal articles to learn more about visual snow. I even go online and find blog posts of patients with visual snow describing their symptoms and the life they're having. That's how misunderstood visual snow is. I guess visual snow is so misunderstood because patients with it don't know how to describe it to other people, and there's sort of fear that they will be classified as crazy or mentally ill by people around them. So if you have visual snow, Please leave a comment in the comment section below to share your experience with others because we really need to be talking about this. Now, visual snow doesn't come alone. Other symptoms come along with it. One of them is nectolopia, which means the inability to see at nighttime. Then you may have palinopsia, which means seeing something that isn't there anymore. For example, if you pick up this cup, you may see this ghost-like after image of the cup resting on the table that obviously isn't there anymore. Or you can see continuous trails of moving objects, like when you move your hand really quickly and you'll see this trailing um, of your hand. And there's another one called photophobia, that is a heightened sensitivity to light. For example, when you're outside during the day and you can't stand the sunlight while people around you find it tolerable. Again, this is also me. And that's probably the reason why I always wear sunglasses when I'm outside during the day. One last one would be enhanced and topic phenomena which are visual effects whose sources come from within the eye. One notable one is floaters. Most of us have mild to moderate floaters due to aging, myopia, inflammation, or the trauma, but patients with visual snow could have more noticeable floaters that they become bothersome. Or patients can have the blue field entoptic phenomena, that is, seeing little bright dots traveling on the rigid path, especially when we look up to the sky. 
Blue fear and toxic phenomena is thought to be the shadows of the white blood cells traveling in the retinal capillaries. Most people are not too bothered by this visual phenomenon, but a patient with visual snow can be more sensitive to it and can not only see them when looking out to the sky, but also when reading a book or working on a computer screen. Again, this is also me. Some patients can even report seeing spontaneous photopsia or flashes of light at the periphery of their vision. There's another one called migraine aura or simply kaleidoscope vision, which means patients see colorful clouds or swirls drifting their vision, similar to seeing through a kaleidoscope. These color swirls can progress over time and extend over your visual field, and they tend to disappear within an hour. It's important to note that not all patients with visual snow syndrome have all of these four symptoms, but they will at least have two of them. In this composite illustration, you can see the possible level of visual disability when all these symptoms come together. As you can see, there are obvious flows that are drifting along the side here. There's blue field antoptic phenomena, and there are these moving statics. You can see this trail of other images when the car is passing by, and this goes like after image next to the roadside. This is basically what the vision of a patient with severe visual snow syndrome. In addition to visual symptoms, patients could suffer from another non-visual symptoms. One notable one is migraine. A 2014 study of 120 patients with visual snow found that 70 of them also had migraines, although 37 also had typical migraine ores. However, while over half of patients with visual snow suffer from migraines, migraine ore and visual snow are separate entities. In fact, many patients with visual snow were misdiagnosed as migraine aura in the past, and in many cases of visual snow, patients are treated similarly to those with migraine aura, often with limited or no success. Patients usually achieve good control over their migraines with medication without any improvement in the visual snow symptoms. Then, patients may have tinnitus, which is rain in the ears. Other patients may have vertigo, that is a sense of spinning or dizziness, or you can have anxiety or depression, and you can sometimes feel sad and tired. And again, that's also me. Historically, and not until recently, visual snow was believed to arise from a hallucinogenic drug use, such as marijuana and ecstasy. Visual snow occurring secondary to drugs is persistent for months or even years after stopping the drug, and they usually don't go away on their own. However, just recently, neurologists and ophthalmologists have concluded that patients can still suffer from visual snow syndrome even without any history of hallucinogenic drug use. In fact, most patients suffering from visual snow syndrome don't have a history of drug abuse. Some patients even report having visual snow for as long as they could remember. However, people taking these harsh drugs may indeed have permanently altered the visual pathways leading to visual snow and other symptoms. At the timing of this video, doctors don't fully understand the pathophysiology of visual snow, and in fact, there aren't any objective ways to accurately diagnose visual snow syndrome. While many doctors would carry on an osteomologic evaluation to rule out secondary etiology for the symptoms, most patients with visual snow have no objective abnormalities on autosomic testings, and one study of seven visual snow patients performed extensive testing and did not find any ocular pathology. So yes, unfortunately, with the technology we have today, we don't even have a way to accurately detect the presence of visual snow, not to mention discovering its cause. However, scientists do propose a theory on the possible cause of visual snow, and that's called selenocortical dysrhythmia. Selenocortical dysrhythmia is believed to be a miscommunication between the salamus and the visual cortex, which results in abnormal visual processing causing visual snow syndrome. The nerve cells in the brain of people with visual snow syndrome may be too responsive to visual stimuli, these very sensitive nerve cells mistakenly send signals to the brain, and the brain interpret them as real images. Hey, by the way guys, if you are liking this video so far, don't forget to smash the like button for me. Your support is motivation to keep going. In terms of treatments, unfortunately treatments for visual snow are very limited, given how misunderstood and mysterious visual snow is, so doctors have not yet found a consistent treatment that works for everyone. Sometimes put patients on migraine medication, which obviously doesn't work because migraine is migraine and visual snow is visual snow. In fact, one case report even said migraine medications worsen visual snow syndrome. Some studies try other medications such as sertraline and lamotrigine, but again, the results are not consistent. Some other studies propose color prescription glasses for treating visual snow. Researchers have tried yellow lenses, blue lenses, and rose colored lenses to try on their patients. However, in this study, the results are very subjective because they all depend on patient's feedback. 
At least for me, and this color lenses don't seem to do much for my visuals now, even though I don't really need them anyway. This lenses distort my color vision and make performing certain daily tasks a little difficult, so I personally would not stick with them. So this should be an overview of visual stone syndrome. Again, visual stone syndrome is a very misunderstood and mysterious condition, so there isn't much research on it. If you are interested in learning visual snow, or if you want to donate to ongoing research, feel free to check out the Visual Snow Initiative because, guess what? There are actually quite a number of people suffering from Visual Snow Syndrome, and they are stuck in this violent and everlasting storm. Some of them are so debilitated by Visual Snow that they can barely work, drive, or live a normal life. Your support could help someone in the world to see it, see a little bit better, or relight the hope for life. If you have visual snow, you can also mention your symptoms to your eye doctor because only when the eye care world begins to recognize this condition that eye doctors will finally work together to find a cure for visual snow and better understand our visual system in general. Alright, thank you for watching. Take care of yourself. 